All right, everybody, welcome back. Today we are talking about something I think we're all pretty curious about, light. It's definitely one of those things we take for granted. Totally, like we just sort of strap ourselves into these giant metal tubes and hurdle ourselves through the air at hundreds of miles an hour. Right, and somehow we trust that it's all gonna work out. Exactly, and you know, we got a ton of questions from you all about how it all actually works. Like what's the science behind it? Luckily, you sent in some awesome material about this. Yeah, there's some really fascinating stuff in there. So let's dive into that a little bit. I think most people, when they picture what makes a plane fly, they think of the wings, right? For sure. Yeah, the wings are kind of the iconic image. But like, what is it about the shape of the wings? Mm -hmm. I feel like I've heard that it's the curved shape. You're right. It is about the shape. But there's more to it. It's not just the curve itself. It's how that curve interacts with the air and the plane's speed. So it's not as simple as like the curved top of the wing just magically sucks the plane upwards. Uh-huh. No, not quite. Although it can seem kind of magical sometimes, it's more about pressure. Pressure. Okay, so walk us through that. Okay, so picture this. You've got the air flowing over the wing as the plane moves forward. Now, because of that curved shape, what we call the camber, the air traveling over the top has to travel a slightly longer distance than the air flowing underneath. Okay, so it's like a longer road on top, shorter road on the bottom. Exactly. And to cover that longer distance in the same amount of time, the air on top has to move faster. Ah, uh, so the air on top is in a hurry. Haha, <laughs> pretty much. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Faster moving air actually has lower air pressure. So you've got this area of lower pressure on top of the wing and higher pressure underneath. And what does higher pressure do? It pushes, right. So the higher pressure underneath is pushing the wing up against the lower pressure above it. Okay. That's what creates lift. You got it. It's like an invisible hand pushing the plane skyward. That is so cool. So it's not just about the shape of the wing. It's about how that shape manipulates the air pressure around it. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned something else earlier. You said it also has to do with the plane's speed. So how does that come into play? Speed is crucial for generating enough lift to overcome the plane's weight and get it off the ground. That makes sense. The faster you go, the faster that air has to move over the wing and the greater the pressure difference. Precisely, it's all connected. And here's something else to consider. The air itself isn't constant. What do you mean? Well, air density changes with altitude. The higher you go, the thinner the air gets. Right, less air up there. But wouldn't that actually make it easier to fly? Less stuff in the way? It seems intuitive, but it's actually the opposite. Less dense air actually means less lift. It's like trying to swim in a pool versus the ocean. Oh, I see. You get more resistance, more pushback from the denser water in the ocean. So the denser the air, the more oomph it has to push up on the plane. Exactly. And that's why takeoff is usually more difficult at higher altitudes or in hotter temperatures where the air is less dense. Pilots actually have to make adjustments, like increasing their takeoff speed to compensate for that. Wow. I never realized how much the air itself could impact flight. So if thinner air at higher altitudes means less lift, does that mean planes just have to keep flying faster and faster the higher they go? Like, how fast are we talking here? Well, it's not quite a linear relationship, but you're right. Pilots do need to maintain a certain speed to generate enough lift at cruising altitude, which is usually somewhere around 500 miles per hour. 500 miles per hour. That is mind-blowing. And we're just casually sipping our coffee up there. But hold on a second. I feel like we found something about takeoff speeds that kind of blew our minds. Didn't we read about a plane that could take off at, like, ridiculously low speeds, something crazy low. You must be talking about the Super Cub. It can actually yeah. take off at speeds as low as 35 miles per hour. 35 miles per hour. I mean, that's yeah. that's slower than some people drive on the highway. How is that even possible? It's a testament to some really clever engineering. The Super Cub has this high lift wing design. It's got a greater wingspan in proportion to its size and weight. And it uses these things called slats and flaps on the wings to maximize lift even at low speeds. Slats and flaps. So it's like they're manipulating the wing shape even further to get the most out of that lift. You got it. The slats are on the front of the wing and they help to smooth out the airflow at those low speeds, preventing stalling, which is when you lose lift. And the flaps, which are on the back of the wings, they extend downwards, effectively increasing the wing surface area which also helps increase lift at low speeds so it's like they're temporarily making the wing bigger to get that extra boost that's amazing yeah it's incredible how much science and engineering goes into all of this but i'm curious we've talked a lot about lift and air pressure but what are the actual like physics principles at play here like what makes it all work 
Well, you can't talk about Lyft without mentioning Bernoulli's principle. Have you heard of that? I feel like I vaguely remember that name from high school physics, but it's a little fuzzy. Remind me. Of course. So imagine you have a narrow channel of water flying. If you constrict that channel, what happens to the speed of the water flow? It speeds up, right? Like if you put your thumb over the end of a garden hose, the water shoots out faster. Exactly. That's Bernoulli's principle in action. It states that as the speed of a fluid, in this case air, increases, its pressure decreases. Okay, so that faster moving air over the top of the wing is creating an area of lower pressure compared to the slower moving air underneath. And that pressure difference is what's creating lift. You got it. Bernoulli nailed it centuries ago, and it's one of the key principles behind why those massive planes can stay up in the air. It's incredible how it all ties together. And speaking of things tying together, isn't there another big name in physics that's kind of essential to understanding flight? You're thinking about Newton, aren't you? Bingo. Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. But how does that fit into all of this? It's not like planes are bouncing off of the air or anything, right? Not quite bouncing, but you're on the right track. Remember those powerful engines we talked about? They generate thrust, which propels the plane forward. Now, as the plane moves through the air, the shape of the wings, that curved upper surface we discussed earlier, forces the air downward. Okay, so the wings are pushing the air down, but I still don't see how... And that's where Newton's third law kicks in. If the wings are pushing the air down, then the air must be pushing right back up. It's like a perfect partnership. Precisely. The air pushes back with an equal and opposite force, creating lift, counteracting gravity, and allowing those massive hunks of metal to soar through the sky. Amazing, isn't it? It really is. It's like this perfectly synchronized push and pull between the plane and the air. A delicate dance with gravity, you could say. But it's not a one-time deal, right? It's not like once you're off the ground, you just cruise along without a care in the world. What about when you're up at 30,000 feet or coming in for a landing? What happens then? You're hitting on a key point here. It's a constant dance. Right, because things are always changing. The air density, the wind condition. Exactly. A plane isn't just battling gravity. It's constantly responding to a whole symphony of forces. And the pilot is the conductor, making adjustments to keep everything in harmony. Okay, so walk us through some of those adjustments. Like what's happening in the cockpit during takeoff, for example? Well, to get that initial lift, remember we need thrust. Right, from those powerful engines. Exactly, so the pilot increases the engine thrust, creating that forward force we were talking about. More thrust means more speed, which means more air flowing over the wings, which means... More lift. Bingo, it's like hitting the gas pedal in the sky. So takeoff is all about power. But what about once you're up at cruising altitude? Do pilots still need to adjust things? Or is it pretty much smooth sailing from there? Oh, there are still adjustments to be made for sure. Remember we were talking about that angle of attack earlier? The angle between the wing and the oncoming airflow. That's the one. Well, pilots can actually adjust that angle using these things called elevators on the tail of the plane. Wait, so by tilting the wing slightly, you can actually change how much lift they generate. That's wild. That's the beauty of it. It's all about finding that perfect angle for the current conditions. Too steep of an angle, and you risk something called a stall. A stall. That doesn't sound good. It's not. Basically, if the angle of attack is too steep, the airflow over the wing can become disrupted, causing a sudden loss of lift. Yikes. So it's all about finding that sweet spot, that perfect balance between enough angle of attack to generate lift, but not so much that you risk stalling. You got it. And this balancing act continues throughout the entire flight as the plane encounters things like turbulence, changes in air density, even shifts in weight distribution. Wow, so it's like a constant juggling act up there. And speaking of delicate maneuvers, what about landing? It seems like that would require a whole other set of adjustments. You're right, landing is its own challenge. I mean, you're going from what? Hundreds of miles per hour to a complete stop? And you have to do it gently. Right, no smashing into the runway. So how do they do it? Well, this is where those flaps we mentioned earlier come in again. The things on the Super Cub that help to take off at those crazy low speeds. Those are the ones. Larger planes use them for both takeoff and landing. By extending the flaps on the trailing edge of the wings, the pilot can actually increase both lift and drag. Hold on a second, increase both. I thought we wanted to decrease lift to land. We do, but we have to do it gradually. So you don't just drop out of the sky. Right, so the flaps allow for a controlled descent because they increase drag, which helps to slow the plane down 
but they also provide a little extra lift, which allows the plane to descend more slowly and more safely. So it's like putting on the brakes, but also adding a little parachute at the same time. Precisely. It's all about finesse, and those flaps give the pilot that extra control during landing. But it's not just the flaps. Pilots also have those slats on the front of the wings that we talked about. Right, to smooth out the airflow, especially at lower speeds. Exactly. And they also make adjustments with the throttle, the elevators on the tail, and even the rudder, which controls the yaw, or the left and right movement of the plane, to maintain complete control during the descent and touchdown. Wow, it's amazing how much goes into a seemingly simple flight. Right, and we've only just scratched the surface. Seriously, it makes you appreciate the skill of pilots even more. They're like, air wizards up there or something. Uh, yeah, air wizards juggling all these different forces to make it look easy. So next time I'm on a plane, what should I be paying attention to? Like, can I actually see any of these adjustments in action? Oh, definitely. Pay attention to the nose of the plane. You'll notice it tilts upward during takeoff. Right, to get that higher angle of attack. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and you might feel it tilt slightly during the flight too, especially if there's some turbulence. That's the pilot adjusting to those changing wind conditions and air pressure. So even those little movements, I feel, are all part of this intricate dance to keep us in the air. Exactly, and when you're coming in for landing, watch how the plane seems to almost float a little bit just above the runway. Oh yeah, it's like it pauses for a second before it touches down. That's the pilot really expertly managing that decrease in lift so we have that nice smooth landing. Man, this whole conversation has been a real eye-opener. It really is incredible when you think about it. I mean, we're talking about these giant metal birds de defying gravity. It's a testament to, well, a lot of things really. Physics, engineering, human ingenuity. Absolutely. And the bravery of those first pilots who are basically just like, well, let's see what happens if we strap this engine to this thing with wings. I know. Oh, it's pretty wild to think about how far we've come from those early days of flight. Right, and who knows what we'll be able to do in the future. Flying cars, maybe. Yeah. Jetpacks. Hey, a wizard can dream. That's right. But in the meantime, I'll be over here marveling at the magic, or I guess the science of flight. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive, everyone. Until next time.